Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel as well as videos like this where I talk about objects and artifacts of great magical power. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel or backing me on Patreon and absolutely subscribe to me here as I upload at least twice a week. You've got nothing to lose. Following on from the first video on the history of the magical artifices in the Forgotten Realms and also the the single video that I've made so far on the Netheral Empire, so we'll be talking a lot about the Netheral Empire, obviously, in this video, and the role of the Artificer class on Faerun. No discussion of magic technology for that setting can even be a little bit complete without knowledge of the Nether Scrolls, arguably the most important magical artifacts on the face of Toril. Even though, technically, they are merely minor artifacts, they have punched way above their weight class, so to speak, historically, and you will soon see why. According to the Lost Empires of Faerun, page 156-157, the Nether Scrolls, two sets of Nether Scrolls exist, each consisting of 50 individual scrolls. One complete set lies in the depths of Windsong Tower in the ruins of Mithranor, where it takes the form of a golden beech tree known as the Quesar Teranthvar, Golden Grove of Hidden Knowledge. The other set has been broken up and mostly lost, at least until the year of Moonfall, uh, 1344 DR, Three scrolls from this latter set lay in the Hall of Mists beneath the Grandfather Tree of the High Forest. Two others are in the Crypt of Hishtak, which now lies beneath the sands of the Western Anorok Desert. A few of the remaining scrolls have been destroyed, and the location and current state of these, well, they remain unknown. In fact, I doubt very much they are completely destroyed. Each scroll is an 8-inch by 10-inch sheet, so about the size of a standard photocopy A4 paper of thin rolled gold enchanted to be as flexible as paper. Silvery magical writing crawls across its surface, appearing almost alive. The scroll's small size belies the staggering amount of information it holds. As soon as one page of text has been read, the writing swims and moves about the sheet, reforming into the next page of text. All in all, it takes approximately one month of dedicated study to review a single nether scroll. So it's basically like a Kindle. The Nether Scrolls form the foundation of modern magical theory on Faerun. Virtually every mage who has mastered any portion of the art since the rise of Netheril received their knowledge, albeit indirectly, from the Nether Scrolls. Consequently, much of the information contained in these scrolls is now considered common knowledge in Faerun's magical community. Nevertheless, the Nether Scrolls still contain a huge wealth of information that is useful to any student of the art. Reading even one nether scroll offers considerable insight into the art of magic. The Encyclopedia Arcana says, This set of 50 scrolls was the foundation for magic used by the netherese, perhaps by all of the sentient races that developed on Faerun. Some races, like the elves, brought their own magic with them when they migrated to Toril. It's doubtful that their style of magic use was influenced much by the Nether Scrolls, but for the Netherese, their ability to use magic and the wisdom contained within the Nether Scrolls were forever entwined, and it's unknown who created the Nether Scrolls by them. They don't, they don't know. Some believe that they were gifts left by the creator races to the humans of Toril. Others believe that they were a gift from Mistral, the uh, previous goddess of magic herself. Others believe... Uh, beliefs hold that the nether scrolls are of otherworldly origin, perhaps from the outer planes or for, from some crystal sphere beyond realm space, because the uh, Emperor of Netheril definitely did know about other crystal spheres. What's known about the nether scrolls was that they appeared as sheets of gold and platinum. They were covered with magical runes and sigils that uh, shimmered upon their surface. Anyone who saw them immediately knew that they contained magical power and wisdom. The small size of each scroll belied its content. They contain a vast amount of information. Magic weaved its way across the surface, turning a quick reading page of text into a tome that could take months to finish. In addition, there never seemed to be an end to the amount of information contained on a single scroll. As one developed in the mystical arts and reread the scrolls, new passages and spells appeared almost sentiently. The Nether Scrolls were immune to all magical effects, including disintegration spells and other harmful magic. They could be hammered into unrecognizable mass. However, as was demonstrated a few times in Netheril's long history, eventually 
The magic of the Nether Scrolls would recombine lost pieces of itself. By the time re- required for such a rebirth was long. It's unknown if it has reformed currently, but the Netherese never saw the scrolls reform themselves thus far. But we know that they can regenerate. The Nether Scrolls were unlike normal scrolls in that their magic wasn't just sitting there to be read like a normal scroll. Instead, they were to be studied and pored over. The reader searched for new pieces of magical lore. The scroll was interactive. They were unable to be duplicated by any means because of this personalised effect, and the Netherese kept them as safe as they could until finally losing the last scroll. The scrolls appeared to be divided into five sections of ten scrolls each. Just like the scrolls themselves, however, this five-part organisation could have disappeared after enough study, and they would have differentiated themselves depending on the person who was reading them. The first group is Arcanus Fondaire. These first scrolls provided the basics of spellcasting, including the use of cantras, spell components, and the various magical schools, such as alteration and invocation, among many others. These schools were the very foundation on which magic was built, though the Netherese choose to combine them into three categories, inventive, mentalism, and variation, were the categories they call they, uh, the schools of magic they built their magical knowledge on. The next group of scrolls was the Magicus Creare. These scrolls divided the, they detailed the creation of magical items, yet hinted at a wide range of possibilities beyond the basic construction of such items, essentially technology. Magic items that became part of the creator were hinted at, as was the creation of sentient magic items for specific purposes, so cybernetics, robotics. Most of these scrolls were stolen or destroyed before much work could be done in this area, however. The next group was Major Creer, the Creation Scrolls. As Arcanist quickly referred to them, uh, detailing the process of creating magical constructs such as golems. More than that, they also taught the elements of creating living wards, artificial items designed to augment an Arcanist. A weak example would be something akin to the eyes of minute seeing goggles, and sentient wards, items that actually thought for themselves and have the ability to perform actions, such as an extra hand that would activate a staff to protect itself. Finally, these scrolls detailed the properties of anti-magic as projected by creatures like beholders. It also discussed ways to both create and destroy dead magic areas. The next group was the Planus Mechanicus. Not only did these scrolls detail planner mechanics, in explaining how the different planes of existence were related to one another and how magic worked on each plane, they also detailed the process by which to create pocket planes. These scrolls were the ones that showed Shadow studied over the course of his life, and he was the foremost expert on all planes, all of the planes in Netheral. Ars Factum was the last group. This final set of nether scrolls provided the foundation of the actual creation of artifacts from scratch. It was the most difficult to fathom and required extensive knowledge of all other nether scrolls before one could even unlock its power. A few arcanists tried anyway. However, they ended up creating the the, uh, crown of horns and the scepter of the sorcerer kings. Now, in the earlier edition of the game... The study of these scrolls boosted the player character's level in their spellcasting character class, but this really doesn't work well for 5th edition general play. It's fine if the DM accommodates this perfectly fit, uh, this perfectly well into the game, if it's the intention. For example, if the end of the campaign is in sight and there's a need to ramp things up considerably, piling on a bunch of levels all at once is an awesome thing to do at your table. Full-on training montage. The fighter has access to the Manual of Gainful Exercise, a very rare wondrous item, but this could easily be bumped up to an artifact level item that levels them up as well. However, if that's not the intention of the Nether Scrolls appearing in the game, I suggest just providing access to all spells that don't include a famous wizard's name, as these were not invented until the scrolls were uh, after the scrolls were created, and provide the specific benefits including uh, in, included in each individual group of scrolls so that collectively these scrolls are not so disruptive to gameplay. So essentially you're, you're talking about months and months of study for each group of uh, scrolls. Looking over the source material it's not hard to work out what these benefits would be. The Nether Scrolls are divided into five chapters each covering a different aspect of the art. A character who manages to read all ten scrolls, so that's ten months at least, that make up a chapter gains an additional benefit whose nature depends on the topic studied. The chapters of the Nether Scrolls and the benefits they provide are, for the first uh, chapter, Arcanus Fondaire, Foundations of Magic, 
give a plus one to all of the DCs for all arcane spells cast by that caster from now on. For the second group, the Magicus Crea, Spells of Creation, provides the uh, Magical Adept feat. The Major Crea, the Magic Creations, provides the knowledge of how to construct a golem. Pretty straightforward. Planus Mechanus, Study of the Planes, provides the knowledge of the Plane Shift spell, as well as spells that are required for protection from adverse environmental effects. Essentially, they just get a crash course on planar travel. Ars Factum, or the Creation of Artifacts, provides the Ritual Caster Feat, and it's supposedly this chapter that taught the reader how to create magical artifacts. But an additional key of some kind is, is needed to unlock the set of scrolls. And the spellcasters of Windsong Tower never discovered what that key is. It may actually have never been translated into the second set of scrolls. We don't know. It's really up to you as the DM. I think gaining three feats and the boost to spell strength is workable. Not too overpowered for these minor artifacts. And they create a great incentive for players to find a way to study these scrolls in the downtime in between adventures. There is some mystery surrounding the set owned by the elves. The popular story, most consider this to be true by the way, is that the Quest R. Teranthvar was set was transformed by a high elven mage into a slim golden beech tree with leaves of gold and was held in Mithdrenor in Windsong Tower before the city of Song was overrun by fiends, but its current location is not known. This is not actually true. The Leaves of Gold are another sort of artifact entirely, and I will talk about them at the end of this video because it's actually really interesting in and of themselves. So I look forward to that. The fate of the other set of Nether Scrolls is wholly unknown, but at various times over the years, a series of unsubstantiated claims have been made that one or two of the Nether Scrolls has been recovered leading to some sages to speculate that this set is no longer a single collection but individual scrolls scattered over the realms, which is very difficult. This is nebulous because, of course, you as the DM decide where the scrolls surface in your game world, and traditionally these are objects, they're, they're basically indestructible. Even physically ruined, they magically free reform again. So rumours of their destruction are always speculative, and nobody knows how long it actually takes them to reform these objects self-repair so looking at them it's impossible to tell just how old they actually are but they are really really old so let's take a look at the history of the scrolls in human history the story begins in minus three uh, three thousand five hundred and thirty three dr and here i will quote the text from the page five of the netheral empire of magic box set and the book titled the winds of netheral in that box set this was only 326 years from the official founding of Netheril from the original seven fishing villages, so very early in the nation's history. The year 326 marked one of the most important dates in Netheril's history, the discovery of the Nether Scrolls. The set of 100 scrolls provided the Netherees with an incredible jump in spellcraft unseen in the history of Toril. This was an age of tremendous learning in Netheril that lasted until the birth of its greatest arc wizards. The person responsible for unearthing these vital pieces of magical lore was unknown. He's simply referred to as Finder. While searching the area west of the Far Horns Forest, Finder ran across an ancient ruined building that appeared to have been un uh, to have been inhabited by a race who utilized the walls as well as the floor. The chairs and utilitarian furnishings seem to indicate the species possessed more than two legs, possibly four. Finder searched every nook and cranny in this old dilapidated building hoping to find something of value to sell when he reached home. When he discovered the gold scrolls he realized he had found something worth far beyond the scrolls monetary value. He returned the scrolls to Netheril and studied them incessantly. Finder discovered that the 100 gold pages were actually two sets of 50 scrolls. One set looked much older and tarnished than the other. He called the gold foils the Nether Scrolls, named after the young nation of his birth, and shared his newfound information with the arcanists of Seventon and Zenith a few years later. Within a few short decades, everyone in Netheril was blessed with the knowledge contained in the scrolls. One thing that is quite different in the time of Netheril is that all the spells that they cast had different names. In Netheril, Spellcasters' reputations were such that they were known by the spells they invented, and most of the spells that existed in the player's handbook, that we read and use right now, were actually created recently, in Netheril's age of magical invention. There are details of exactly who created the spells and when. For example, the spell Smolin's Replica 
was created by the Archmage Smolin in minus 1916 DR and is now commonly known as the spell Mirror Image. This and other related spells are derived from a common magical principle contained in the Nether Scrolls which Smolin mastered and expanded on during his career. So where did the scrolls actually come from? Well, it turns out we do know who made them, and they are really old. Over 30,000 years ago, the Nether Scrolls of, or the Golden Skins of the World Serpent were created in the Imperial City, or Remi, by the reptilian creator race, the Saruk. They sought to gather all magical knowledge from their vast empire's borders into one location in order to consolidate their arcane power. This effort spawned its own secret society, the Ba'eteth, who were studying the primitive forms of magic utilized by other the various races on Faerun at the time, and their clandestine activity actually lasted thousands of years after the fall of the empires of the created races that just carried on working in the background. Their great work of creation included magic from the Batrachi and the Eri empires as well, but not the giants, the dragons, the fae, the humans, or the dwarves, who would not be a significant magical presence on the world of Toril until much later. A vast tract of time passes, and there is only speculation on how the golden skins of the world serpent came into the possession of the elves, but I'm pretty sure that it was the dark elves who built the structure where Finder later found them. For all we know, the scrolls could have been involved in the genocidal war between the giants and uh, the dragons. We just don't know. But we can pick the trail up again after 3,000 years after the scrolls were made and with the arrival of the elves. The first elves came to Toril around minus 27,000 DR in three racially distinct immigration waves through portals opened by the Fae with the declared goal to erode the power of the dragons who ruled the world at the time. It's always been the elves' intention to dis, uh, to dissuade the uh, dragons from taking over Toril. During that era, the dragons acted like tyrants who viewed other races as inferior, and even the metallic ones couldn't be called good back then. However, the Dark Elves, or Tribe Eletheri, as they were known, became uh, part of the second wave and the most successful, differed from the others in that they wanted to found a nation rather than just fight the dragons. The Eletheri negotiated with them and gained a piece of land where they could build Eletheri. Personally, I believe it was their discovery of the scrolls and their mastery of magic that led them down this path of conquest. Eventually, their worship of the Spider Queen, the goddess Lolth, and I'm, I'm contracting this quite a bit, led to the outcast, cursed creatures known as Driders, who could well have built a structure where they walked around in the walls and the ceiling as well as the floor, with utilitarian furnishings. It makes sense to me that they would perhaps find a way to steal and duplicate the ancient scrolls. Who knows? Perhaps this was around the time of the Dark Disaster, and they thought that their civilization was coming to an apocalyptic end. Well... They did get turned into drow eventually, so fair call. But for whatever reason, the guardians of the scrolls perished, and there, were, there the items lay, forgotten, for thousands of years, undisturbed, until Finder discovered them in minus 3,533 DR. 438 years later, the elves of Cormanthir steal one set of the nether scrolls and hide it away in Windsong Tower. Then, 1,200 years later, a band of thieves stole 24 parts of the Nether Scrolls from the chambers of the ancient Netherese lich, uh, Iolum. Frightened of discovery, they smashed these scrolls into golden lumps and sold them. But we know that that's not the end of these scrolls' story. Okay, last but not least, the Leaves of Gold, in an epic article uh, written by Eric L. Boyd. Mintipa Moonsilver is one of the legendary bards of the Forgotten Realms, and tales of his adventures have long been recounted around hearthfires across the north in musical, poetic, and narrative forms. Transcribed in Silvery Moon's Vault of the Sages by the Keeper of the Vault, Mintipa's chapbook is a compilation of the Lonely Harpist ballads, poems, and tales. Here's one part of them, written down in the year uh, 1344 DR. Autumn's Turning yields leaves of gold a mantle fit for woodland kings wood nymphs weep cold tears of sorrow and yet the fair hammergrass sings oft confused with the nether scrolls the leaves of gold are an obscure magical phenomenon believed to be unique to the northern high forest it all takes place in the high forest specifically the region of the woods that lies near the city of eveland 
and is commonly known as the Woods of Turlang. The leaves of gold take the form of living oak leaves fashioned of pure gold, each of which is inscribed with the runes of a single wizard's spell. No more than a dozen such gilded leaf scrolls have been recovered in a single season, and each has been found near the base of an ancient tree believed to have once been a great treant in centuries past. Taken at face value, the first two lines of Mintipa's poem seem to describe the changing hues of Northland woodlands. However, those familiar with the legend of the leaves of gold believe that Mintipa is alluding to here to the time of year where such treasures as of the art may be gathered. The reference to woodland kings is then interpreted as wood rulers, a title which the treants of the high forest are most commonly referred to, yielding the general location of where the leaves of gold can be gathered. And it, I should point out that the high forest has always been a center of elven power in uh, Faerun for a very long time in, in the uh, continent's history. At the most straightforward level, the next two lines again refer to the site of life, death and rebirth. Wood nymphs is common, uh, a common appellation for dryads in the ilk, and the reference to cold tears of sorrow suggests the coming of winter. The hammergrass is an obscure name, sometimes employed by the faithful of Meiliki for Our Lady of the Forest, and her singing can be seen as a promise that the cycle of life will continue and that winter will be of a finite length. However, once again, Mintipa's words can be read at another level, this time alluding to an obscure tale from centuries past. This is the thing with experienced bards, is they layer uh, lore into their compositions so that other bards have a greater appreciation for the hidden knowledge that's contained in these tales. Ere the fall of Netheril, when the Erlani elves ruled the High Forest, there appeared a hammer dryad, skilled in sorcery, whose mastery of the art was said to rival that of the most accomplished elven high mages. The Hammergress, as she was sometimes known, is said to have sprung from the heart of Turlang, the first wood nymph born of a treant and not of an ordinary oak tree. Turlang and the Hammergress ruled the High Forest as king and queen for over a millennium before the fall of Askelhorn in the year of the curse, 882 DR, threatened the High Forest with the taint of the abyss. The Hammergress is said to have given her life to form a living mantle around the High Forest to shield it from an infestation by the twisted vegetation of the abyss. Although her death was an occasion of great sorrow for those races that live in harmony with the great woodlands, it is said that the Hammergrass song still drifts through the forests and woods of Turlang each autumn, whispering words of comfort and magic to her mate. If her breath touches a brilliant golden leaf in the process of drifting to the ground from the limb of a long slumbering treant, it leaves in its eddy a leaf of pure gold inscribed with the workings of a rare or unique spell. Through these leaves of gold, the forest can be defended against looming threats to its existence. So in effect, it's like the spirit of this creature has created its own mythal and uh, become infused in the forest as a living spell that can transcribe spells onto leaves in a mystical process that carries on the legacy of her protecting the forest. Beautiful. If you like the lore in these videos, don't forget to check out videos by fellow Forgotten Realms lore masters. Check out my channels tab, where I have a list of them for you to explore. Please hit the like button if you made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some merchandise. We're all geek with pride. And as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.